Muthi with BBC World News, our top stories. A suicide bomber has struck in the Afghan capital. At least three members of the NATO-led military forces have been killed. The US targets Islamic State militants in a fresh round of airstrikes, the first under a new strategy to defeat the group. Ukraine's lawmakers in Kiev prepare to ratify a landmark EU deal as unrest continues in the east. And America is set to deploy 3,000 troops to Liberia to help fight the worst ever outbreak of Ebola. Hello. A suicide bomb attack in the Afghan capital, Kabul, has killed at least three members of the NATO-led military forces and injured many others. The explosion targeted a convoy on the airport road near the U.S. Embassy. The Taliban says that it carried out the attack. Well, the explosion is the first major bomb attack in the city in weeks. Let's go live to Kabul and our correspondent, first of all, the BBC Persians correspondent, Kawun Kamush. And I gather you were very nearby when this explosion explosion happened? What, what do you know? What did you see or hear? Uh, I was standing on the roadside and just a big and huge blast happened. I saw lots of people uh, shocked as myself and escaping from the area as the uh, su suicide attack happened on the busiest time of the day uh, at 8 a.m. when the people come from their houses and go to their uh, works. And can you tell us about what you saw in the aftermath of that bomb? After the, uh, the blast, I saw uh, lots of uh, women and uh, kids escaping from the area. Also, some, uh, a number of vehicles uh, destroyed in the area and broken glasses of the supermarkets close by the area. It happened in a, uh, near a resident area, Macron Third, where Lots of people come uh, at the morning out of their houses and going outside. Is there uh, any reason why this area would be targeted? Sorry? Is there any known reason why this area would be a target? Yeah, the, the, the attack uh, happened nearby the Supreme Court, which is closed by a military camp. Uh, and uh, the U.S. embassy in Kabul. Uh, uh, the uh, attack was huge, and I saw part, body part of uh, people. I don't know w what it relates to, it, the suicide attack or the people, but it was on the street, parts of body, and uh, destroyed of the uh, parts of the vehicles in the, uh, on the street. Obviously, that, I know that's very distressing, and, and we've perhaps got too used to reporting such attacks, but can you just give us an idea from your own personal point of view what it was like to be there at that time? Can you hear me? Yes, can you just give, give me an idea from your own point of view what it was like to, to have to see and hear all that? How, how difficult was that? These attacks happen uh, always uh, target these key points of the city, which is around the uh, in, in, uh, airport, Kabul airport, the key point, Wazirak Barkhan area, which is a diplomatic area. And it sometimes happens in these uh, situations, which is close by the green zone of the Kabul and also some other embassies in the capital. OK, Kawun, I'm sorry about the problems on the line, but thank you very much indeed for that. Let's now go to David Loyne, who is also in Kabul. Uh, David, uh, is there any known reason why, in your view, that we are seeing this kind of attack now? Because it's been relatively quiet for some time now. Yes, the Taliban have been trying, though, and uh, intelligence and... Uh, efforts by the security forces to 
try and find bomb making equipment in this city are very tight. There's tight checks right across the city all the time. So I think this is not the Taliban changing their tactics, but being lucky once. This was a very big bomb uh, being carried in a Toyota Corolla car, targeting very specifically uh, uh, an ISAF vehicle and a vehicle carrying foreign soldiers. Three of those soldiers were killed. One other is very, very seriously injured and in hospital. Five other uh, ISAF soldiers also killed. We don't know their nationality, but there was uh, first aid being given on the ground very quickly after that. Uh, the three who were killed were, were, I think, killed outright because the side of this uh, land cruiser, armoured land cruiser vehicle that they were carrying, uh, that they were being carried in, um, was torn off and the vehicle was thrown across the road against the walls of uh, an American base which is down at the bottom of the airport road, a common target for the Taliban. And if you look at where Afghanistan is right now, um, still without any proper political deal, and so many fears across the region that what we're seeing in Iraq and Syria eventually can that sort of instability return to Afghanistan? Yes, I mean, I think the Afghan forces are much better than the Iraqi forces. They're already facing an Islamist insurgency of some intensity, the Taliban and their allies across the country. And on the whole, although there have been areas in the east and in Helmand where they've been uh, taking some pretty uh, tough uh, uh, fighting in recent months and have lost a lot of people, um, they are holding the ground that they want to hold in those areas, even in Helmand where the Taliban have carried out their most concerted attempt. So uh, we're not in Iraq. Uh, we're not in Syria. We are, though, you're quite right, in a situation of political uncertainty. I think myself that the, uh, the new president, the new uh, coalition government will probably emerge before the end of this week now, but we've been waiting a long time, and the political uncertainty since the first round of voting uh, uh, more than five months ago has affected everything in this country and has given the Taliban an opportunity to believe that they uh, might have more of a stake in the future of Afghanistan and are carrying out uh, more audacious attacks. David Lloyd, for now, many thanks indeed. Good to talk. Thanks. Well, the United States has taken the first step in its wider battle against Islamic State militants. The military said it carried out an airstrike near Baghdad in support of Iraqi forces fighting there. The attack is part of President Obama's expanded mission to protect more than just U.S. interests in Iraq. His fighter jets also struck an IS convoy near Sinjar, near the Syrian border. On the eastern side of Iraq, Kurdish Peshmerga troops continue their fight against Islamic State militants near Erbil. A correspondent, Gabriel Gatehouse, is with them and he sent us this report. It is on these fighters that the statesmen in Paris are pinning many of their hopes. This is one of the Peshmerga's front lines. That town in the distance is held by Islamic State. It was specifically Britain's support for Kurdish forces that the black-masked murderer of David Haynes cited as justification for his killing. The UK is flying weapons and ammunition into northern Iraq to help bolster the Kurds. The weapons we're getting from Britain and the others are good, and we have some weapons of our own, but it's not enough against the terrorist state. We need more to win our war against IS. The Kurds have made modest advances against the jihadists here at Jalaula, which is less than 100 miles from Baghdad. But many of their weapons are old and their stocks are depleted. They say they've yet to receive any of the guns or the ammunition supplied by Britain. This is about as far east as IS goes. We're almost on the border with Iran, but the jihadist state now stretches all the way west across Iraq into Syria and up to the Turkish border. And each time another Western hostage is brutally beheaded on camera, so the pressure grows in Western capitals to do more. We drove towards a second Peshmerga position. In Paris, leaders from 30 countries, including Arab governments, were pledging their support for a coordinated campaign against IS in Iraq, but concrete details were in short supply. In 1991, British, French and American air support helped the Peshmerga defeat Saddam Hussein's army in northern Iraq. Now they say they're ready to take on Islamic State, 
but they need the right help. There's no sense here of preparations for a large-scale ground offensive, but if there were, that would be of little comfort to the second British hostage whose life is now in danger, or the many others who are being held by Islamic State inside Syria. IS is waiting just over a mile from here. Its fighters could come charging back up this road at any moment. Neither the Syrian government nor its principal backer, Iran, was invited to join the coalition of the willing in Paris. In the absence of a unified strategy across Iraq and Syria, it's far from clear whether more bombing will have the desired result. Gabriel Gatehouse reporting there for us. Now, the Ukrainian and U European parliaments are due to vote in a few hours' time on a controversial association agreement strengthening economic and political ties. President Petro Poroshenko has called the agreement historic, but he's been criticised for agreeing to delay the implementation of the free trade rules until the end of 2015. David Stern is in Kiev. David, you have to first of all explain what this deal is for us, please. Well, you may recall that this association agreement, which, you, as you say, consists of a political and a trade side, was what set off the, dem uh, the demonstrations, the protests last year, which eventually culminated in the Ukrainian revolution, the driving uh, being uh, President Viktor Yanukovych, the former president, being driven from power. Um, now this, uh, the agreement has been signed, which is what Mr. Yanukovych refused to do, and today we're going to see the ratification of the agreement. Now, this does not mean, though, that the agreement goes into effect, because as we heard last week, uh, European, uh, Russian, and uh, Ukrainian officials agreed to delay the implementation by 15 months. Um, this has advantages for the Ukrainians. They still have access to, you, you, to the European markets, but there is a great fear here in Kiev that in fact that this is a delay that will be, in fact become permanent or in fact that the, uh, the Russians will use this to hollow out the agreement over the next 15 months. But so as I say, there are positive aspects but there are also great fears. What does it actually mean though for people in both you know, Ukrainian supporting and Russian supporting areas in terms of trade and their economy and everyday life? Well, difficult to say exactly what's going to be the effect. We have seen so far, you, the Europeans have dropped their tariffs for your Ukrainian goods to zero. So Ukrainians do have this access, and apparently it has given a boost to, uh, to the economy. Um, now, when the, uh, the uh, agreement is actually enforced, then the, the Ukrainians will drop their tariffs as well, so European goods will come in here. That's the fear of the Russians, is that once you have all these European goods coming in, they will eventually go into the Russian market. As for the people in the East, they're afraid that this will affect their trade, uh, their trade with Russia. And remember, they have a great deal of trade, uh, steel, coal, all sorts of other things that go uh, from uh, Lugansk and Donetsk into Russia, and they're afraid that this could be affected or even, in fact, cut off. Okay, David, thank you very much. The U.S. is stepping up its response to the Ebola crisis in West Africa. President Obama will announce plans later to send 3,000 troops to Liberia. It's thought he'll send military personnel there to supply medical and logistical support for local staff. There's been criticism of the slow international response to the epidemic, as Alpa Patel reports. For more than six months, Ebola has rampaged through parts of West Africa infecting thousands regardless of age and killing well over 2,000 people, including health workers battling against the odds to help those most in need. For months, the international community have been accused of not doing enough. Now ahead of two key meetings of the United Nations and the UN Security Council, the US ambassador made this plea. We can contain this. We know how to do it, and we must avoid panic and fear. But our collective response to date has not been sufficient. We must move forward aggressively in a coordinated fashion and together. It's highly unusual for the United Nations Security Council to meet and discuss public health issues. But this Ebola outbreak is unprecedented and has become the deadliest on record. One key factor being blamed on the rapid spread.